one of the things that's really helped me get my health back in check is actually staying away from my phone, especially at certain times. And I think one of the things that got me into trouble in the first place was every morning I would wake up and the first thing I would do is check my phone, check Twitter, go on TikTok, read my email. And I always had set out to do that for a couple of minutes, but then you kind of get stuck into a, a sucked into a, a, a black hole and just continuously go on. And sometimes it would just ruin my day and the workout I had planned to do that morning. So what I've done now is in the morning when I wake up, the only thing I do with my phone is use it for an alarm and use it to play music for when I actually go exercise. And I don't check my email. I don't check any of my stuff until after I'm done my workout. And the reason I share this is because it's not that I don't use these things, but I'm very thoughtful of some of the things that, you know, didn't work for me and struggle. And me sharing that also gives me a credibility when I'm working with others saying like, hey, there is a balance to this. Here are some of the negatives, but here are some of the positives. Being able to share this message with you right now is something I think is really, really powerful. But I'm also very cognizant of the times that I use it, a little strategies I have. For example, I have no notifications going to my phone. You can't even call me because they're set off. I choose to go to my phone when it's convenient for me. I never let my phone bring it, um, to bring me to that device. So I think that's a really important thing that we should be able to talk about with our students, with our own kids, in, in that perspective of how do we find that I don't want to say necessarily balanced, but how do we utilize this in meaningful ways? And that's why I love this conversation that I had with Tim Scheiger and Ryan Ruggles. They actually just have a, a new book coming out from uh, AMLE focused on successful middle school instructional technology. And it's out today. And we had really great conversations about this and really how we put people in a situation where we see learning differently because we have access to these devices not just doing the same thing that we always done with technology, because I think it takes away some opportunities when you don't actually utilize the abilities. And how do we think about learning? Is it simply scores or is there something deeper to that? And so we had a great conversation about these topics. Uh, their book is out right now too, and you can check it out in the description down below. Really great conversation. I know you're going to enjoy it. So welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Cross. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm blessed to have Tim Scheiger and Ryan Ruggles, who are the authors of the brand new book and is available right now, uh, Successful Middle School Instructional Technology. Now, we are recording this in September of 2023. Uh, this podcast has been released right after the release date on November 1st. So you can actually check it out below. We're going to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience. And so thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, I just ended the last podcast with you congratulating. I'm going to start this one doing the same thing. So congratulations on the book. I know um, to write something, you know, a focus on this is something that's really needed right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to write it with AMLE, I'm sure is probably, a, you know, a, a great opportunity for, for both of you. And to be honest with you, for AMLE, um, you know, to have practitioners um, sharing the stuff that they're doing. So, um, to start off the podcast, Tim, I'm going to start with you, Tim. If you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do today, and how you got there, it's a great place to start. Sure. Uh, Tim Scheiger, I uh, spent many years, uh, not too many, because I'm still pretty young. Right, right. Um, that's right. We talked about that. As, We're right, young, young exactly. Dating. That's right. I don't, I don't want to date you. I don't want to like, you know, make it like you're old, you're old right? Hey, um, 50, 50 is the new 48, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and so... Uh, middle school uh, teacher for a number of years, a middle school uh, K-8 principal, a middle school principal, and as well as a, as a uh, superintendent for seven years. And so I, uh, I left the superintendency in 2020, mm -hmm. and I have been working with Diamond Assets since then. And what I do there is I work with schools on technology, sustainability, uh, and um, consulting uh, on, on how to plan, uh, strategic planning, et cetera. And um, so I've been there and one of my uh, school board members, my last position uh, owns the company. And so she brought me on board. I'm very thankful for the opportunity. I did get to work with schools all around the country uh, to um, connect, talk about technology and uh, get some things done for them. 
That's awesome. And, and that, you know, that, that middle school experience, you know, it's funny because when I, um, I wanted to be an elementary school teacher, that's what I trained to do. And my very first job was high school and I was okay doing high school. And I, and then I actually did that for a couple for a little while. Then I went to elementary and I swore I would never do middle school ever. And then I actually ended up doing middle school for a while and I loved it. Right. And it's like kind of interesting because you realize, Hey, the jokes I was telling the elementary kids aren't landing <laughs> these middle school kids. Like, it's just like different, you know, and there's different conversations and you know, I it's, it's interesting because I, I had the opportunity to teach all levels. Um, and they're all unique in their own way, right? Like there's something really fascinating about that. So, you know, that's awesome. So Ryan, if you can tell us who you are and what you do, how you got there, great place to start for you too. Absolutely. Thanks, George. First, appreciate being here. Uh, so I, I am the current superintendent of Tomorrow River Schools in uh, Wisconsin. So Amherst, Wisconsin. Uh, first year here, so new to the role, but absolutely loving it. Amazing community here. Hmm. Uh, before that, I was a director of teacher and learning in the school district of Milton. Uh, worked under Tim for a while when he was the superintendent. That's how we got connected and uh, both got to really reminisce on our middle school years. Uh, because before that, I was a, a longtime middle school principal uh, mm. in, the, in the Madison area and in, in Sun Prairie and uh, a little bit of time overseas in international school as well in a, in a middle school. Uh, so so that that's my background. I uh, socialized teacher by trade be, before that time and obviously coached lots of sports like every other teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've always been passionate about good instruction, you, you know, and uh, as as we move to one to one. Uh, just really have grown in instructional technology, just just equal passion there, uh, along with our love for, for middle school. And that that was really what kind of gelled Tim and I to really connect around the, this topic, our love for just good quality instruction, engaging mm -hmm. kids, and, and using instructional technology in in, in ways that, that, that really move the needle and make a difference. Well, and that, so that actually, that's a great kind of way to kind of start focusing on the book and, you know, the thinking that you surround. And I'm sure some of the stuff you'll talk about is in the book and there's going to be other stuff that's outside of the book as well. But one of the things I've heard, you know, cause this is obviously an area that I'm really passionate about too. Uh, and, and, fo and, and have been focused on for basically the beginning of my career, even though I didn't want to, like I was basically kind of forced into it, you know, my, my first job is that when schools went one to one, it actually has no necessarily impact on learning. Now I have, reasons why I believe that to be true. Um, mm -hmm. but like, what are some of your thoughts on that? Cause there's, there is that conversation all the time. It's like when you throw devices in the classroom, there's, there's no, why do we need them? Because it's not actually changing anything about learning. So wh why do you, why do you believe that? And I'm going to start with Ryan on that question. Yeah, absolutely. You know, obviously a lot of folks have been digging into the work of Hattie for years. All right. Mm. What, what really moves it, that, that needle? Um, and, and yeah, just throwing somebody a device, isn't going to move the needle. It's not going to increase achievement and, 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 and better instruction mm -hmm. in, unless there's a goal and there's a plan there. Uh, so I, I, I'm with you on that. I agree wholeheartedly that technology can be a game changer, an absolute game changer in the classroom, but it's, it's got to be with the right philosophy. You, you have to make sure that there, there's, you, you have your why, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, I think that was the, the problem with, with, with the pandemic that we just gave everybody technology and everybody had a device, but, but they didn't have the why they didn't right. have the, the how, and how are we going to use this to really truly engage? So it's not just a, a replacement for a notebook. Uh, and instead of, you know, writing things down there, they're, they're put into a, a Google note. Um, no, how are you really using it to be innovative and, and uh, uh, just change what instruction looks like. Right. So I, 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 I think, that with, with the right PD and, and with the right philosophy and the right structures in place, technology is an absolute game changer in the classroom. Right, and Tim, we got some thoughts on that question too? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, I, I remember our first year uh, going one-to-one -one at the middle school and, you know, you had the initial, okay, let's put the, the social studies worksheet on an iPad, right? right? Okay, well, that first, you know, the first few times, yeah, people are like, oh, the kids are like, hey, I'll do this, right? Even though what, what's less engaging than a social studies worksheet, right? And I taught the subject. And so the, uh, that to, to substitute or also to make it an electronic platform for the same type of behavior in essence is not, is not where it's at. It's really about, are we going to allow the students to 
to create, to uh, experience education in a way that's going to help them better understand it, but also better apply it. As you know, when, when, if it's applicable to your life, then you're likelier to, to, to be attentive. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the issues that we have seen, as Ryan referred to, let's give out devices, devices, whatever, it doesn't matter what the device is, are you giving permission for the staff and the students to try some things? Is it, um, you know, why will, why do kids, why did I put quarters into the video games back in the uh, Aladdin's castle for all those years. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, you, you know, you have your three lives and then you end up putting another quarter in the same kind of thing. Kids will try if there's, if there's that risk reward piece and the allowance. And I think that as adults, what we've done is we've taken technology and just turned it into another example of compliance. Uh, we want to make sure that the kids don't do this or this or this. It's always about the, or it seems to be a lot about don't do as opposed to go try. Mm -hmm. And the there, there's the developing your vision, your purpose, and then how are you going to do it? What are you going to do, et cetera. But as you know, George, a lot of times it comes down to who's the adult in the room and is the adult allowing students to truly learn or is it a, uh, is it just another tool, much like a, a tablet or a pencil or pen or textbook that uh, is in the classroom versus actually using what the capabilities are and, and, and giving students the permission to actually learn and to grow. Um, and I, I think that, that the pandemic, yes, there was a lot of federal money available and a lot of schools went one-to-one -one and they just kind of threw stuff out there. But again, without a plan, without a purpose, without, hey, we just have to have it because we have to have Zoom in case kids have to go back home. Okay, but what are you actually really doing to right. to move the instructional and academic achievement needle? So it's actually, okay, and it's interesting because you said, you know, what's like, there's not much, there's nothing less engaging than like a digital worksheet. And some people would actually say, well, probably a paper worksheet. And mm -hmm. I would actually say, mm, I don't know, because at least, you know, if you're using a device and you're doing a worksheet on it, you're thinking there's so much more I could be doing with this. <laughs> Whereas on a piece of paper, there's not much like, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, how creative you are. There's a, I don't know if you've ever seen the TikTok of like, it's paper. I don't know if you've seen that TikTok series. Yeah. It's like actually yeah. quite amazing. This, whatever, she like builds everything out of paper and she, you don't know where it's coming from. So I, I guess maybe you can be creative with that too. Um, it, it, the, the thing when you, when you, and I think Ryan, I don't know if you mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty sure you mentioned Hattie um, and talking about like effect size. It, it's interesting because I I've, I kind of always have pushed back on the Hattie effect size stuff mm -hmm. in the sense that are we measure, how is learning measured? Mm -hmm. Is it like, here's, are we saying, is learning just used synonymously with, we saw an improvement in test scores mm -hmm. and and it, are we are we actually shifting everything in how we use technology just so we can do better on the test? Or are we saying, hey, there's so many different opportunities here that we could be using this that don't necessarily actually fit into the 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 things that we measure in school, mm -hmm. but can really improve learning? Because I don't think mm -hmm. I I think some I I don't I I don't know that well enough um, mm -hmm. the Hattie stuff to say mm -hmm. that. What, like, how do we know the effect size? What, what was the, how did you measure the differences? Was it based on scores? Right. And like, based on that. And then we just called that learning. Cause I really believe, you know, you can get kids really good at tests, but it doesn't mean they're great learners. And so like, how do you kind of see that, that conversation about like really not using learning and scores mm -hmm. synonymously, even though of course there's a, a relation in some ways, like if I, you know, if I get a higher score in something, you know, like if I get a high score on my driving test, hopefully I can, I have the ability to drive. And mm -hmm. so I learned that process. So how do you see kind of that, maybe that, that connect or disconnect in mm -hmm. like what we're, cause I think part of it too, is if you're just doing the same thing that you were doing before mm -hmm. with technology, then I don't think it's a good solution, mm -hmm. but what are you doing differently now mm -hmm. that you have the technology, I think is what matters most. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with you hundred percent on that. You know, and I, I, 
Yes, absolutely. Achievement is is important. It's 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 yeah. how we are measured as, as schools, you know, by the state, by by our communities, by by, by our parents, um, you know. But I also look at that. That's a piece of the puzzle that I'm going to look at. Uh, the other right. things I think technology can do from an engagement standpoint is uh, keep kids engaged in school, keep them connected to school. Mm-hmm. Let, 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 let's face it, um, kids learn better when when they have a great relationship with their teacher. So if 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 their teacher is is pushing them in, in instruction and they're they're doing collaborative activities, they're doing engaging activities, that kid is going to be more connected to school. They're going to be more apt to show up every single day, excited to learn and try new things. Uh, and and yep, that might not, it might indirectly help some of those, those test scores, but it might not directly affect right. those test scores, but it matters. That's stuff that that definitely really matters. Uh, and one of those things that I think technology can do that we, we don't always give it credit for. Yeah, my 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 conversation that I show this with schools and and organizations I work with, if you get kids to be really great at tests, that doesn't mean they're great learners. But if you develop kids as really great learners, they'll be fine on the tests. And I mm-hmm. I think the the comment that you said, because I'm not I'm I never want to go somewhere and the scores get worse because I went to visit, right? That, that's that's really you know right. I don't want that so, but I think it's really important because some people see it as a piece of the puzzle. Some people mm-hmm. see it as the as a one piece puzzle, mm-hmm. right? And they 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 might say that, but then everything they talk about is measured by that score. And so I think you have to look at what are some different ways. So portfolios are a really big thing for me because it can share learning in different ways, but it's not easily measured. But you can really tell a lot. Like if you want to hear, if you want to know how good a kid is at a language. A score will never tell you as much as actually hearing the kids speak the language over time, right? And it's so easy to capture with podcasting, SoundCloud, blah, 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 the million technologies. So how do we think differently about this? Now, one of the things, and I I, I was really kind of fascinated when you when you brought this up, and I think it's a really important conversation that we need to have, you know, more in education. And I think I think all of us, when we're talking about this, you know, having a conversation before, I, I think a lot of times we want everything just black and white. Like it's either good or bad. Right. And my conversation all the time is no, we just got to be in the gray. It's all gray and we got to get in there. And one of the things you, I know that you talk about in this book is a focus on digital wellness. And I'll start with you, Tim, on this. Like what, when you say digital wellness, what does that, what does that mean? And what does that look like in a classroom? Sure. Well, and, and and you're right. You know, you know, rules and and uh, structures are black and white, but life is lived in the gray. And so, how do we allow the exploration of the gray? And uh, that because that that's where the magic happens, right? When we talk about digital wellness, it's really about you know human wellness, student wellness, school wellness, and, and yet there's there's some digital components mm-hmm. to it, right? A lot of times, it's you know, people will look at at technology and say, there's uh, what is the screen time that you have in your school? Okay, well, I mean, does that really matter? A lot right. of people will say, well, you've got that there's too much screen time, or we need to have lids down. I think that what we've seen over the the the, the last few years, especially, is that that there's a focus on the the social emotional needs of students and and staff, and how does technology play that role? And is it causing more harm than good? Mm-hmm. Again, I don't think technology is evil or, or is the cause of the problem. It's the activities that we do, right? It's the, the other things. But when we talk about digital wellness, it's really about, are we working with students to help them understand the benefits of the use of technology? I mean, there's plenty of, you know, that's, again, going back to uh, carbon dating ourselves, George, when, when back in middle school, for example, if you had a, uh, an, an issue with a friend, there's usually a cooling off period, like maybe you don't right. call them at night or you don't see them until tomorrow. Whereas now there's so much 24 seven access, right? And I can say, well, you know, look at what George did. And then there could be 16 or, you know, likes to that. And then you get upset about it. So it's, it's teaching kids to be good citizens, but the technology, you know, may or may not be the vehicle for that. It's really about finding that life balance, but not blaming technology for all the things that go wrong in a school and having schools say, well, you know what, we're just going to go um, without technology for a while. How does that help? It's much like 
we talk about uh, schools being one to one. Well, let's face it. Most of our students and staff are two or three to one. They'll have a phone and an iPad and their oh. school device. Right. right. So it's not about shutting things off. It's about finding that life balance, but not life balance based on technology. It's about life balance. And then how do you incorporate your technology? So the, actually the, I think it was the American Pediatric Association uh, years ago basically said you shouldn't have screen time for a certain age. And, and then the, they changed the, the, um, the guidelines or the suggestions. Right. And basically I've had this conversation, so I'll, you know, do a keynote and an event and we'll, we'll start talking about this after the fact. And I'll say to someone, how much screen time have you had today? And they'll say, well, actually you haven't been on my phone all the time. I'm like, but do you see the screen behind me that you've been watching while I've been showing slides? Right. And so now here's actually, I want you to think about this differently. So you are, let's say you're on your phone for 15 minutes, but you are seeing the slides I'm sharing for an hour. So were you on the screen? Like where did you have screen time for an hour or is it an hour and 15 minutes, even though it was an hour. So like it, it's confusing. So the, 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 the American pediatric association, when they actually talked about this, the, this shift, and please don't quote me on this stuff. Cause this is like sure. two years ago that they, they, they brought this out, but I thought it was a really interesting conversation. They're basically saying screens are everywhere. So it doesn't matter the time as much as what you are doing when you are in front of a screen. So the analogy that I always use is let's say, um, I'm busy and I'm, let's say I'm doing this podcast right now. And I'm like, okay, I just need my kids to be quiet. I could throw them on to bluey, right. Mm -hmm. Or I can get them watching Peppa Pig. And they won't, they won't move. Like I actually know the safest place they could be is Peppa Pig. Right. And I, like, I always joke, I know that my kids have watched too much Pe Peppa Pig when they start developing a little bit of a British accent. Like that's like, now it's gone too far. <laughs> right. So that's, so do parents do that? Absolutely. Right. And anyone who's pretending they don't is lying to you. So now let's say my daughter and I are watching Sesame street together. And we're having conversations about what's being said there. It's the same amount of screen time, but is it, is it better? So it's not really the, and I think, I think that was a really important point that you brought up, Tim, is that it's not really about how much time you have in front of a screen is what does the time look like when you are utilizing a screen? And that that's, you know, that's cause, cause the reality screens are everywhere, right? You could right. be watching this on YouTube right now and like screen time. Like what if you're listening to this on a podcast right now? Does that change things because you're not looking at a screen, you know, and are you really paying attention? Are you kind of walking? Are you doing other stuff? Is it playing in the background? All that stuff that's going on too. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is when we talk about this notion of, um, you know, balance and conversations, one of the things I say to people when I'm speaking and I talk about my, my experience as a, you know, K-12 teacher, vice principal, principal, central office, and I make sure that they know that. And then we talk about it and then they'll say, oh, like kids are out of balance, out of whack. And I'll say, did it matter to you that I've taught? And they're like, yeah. And I said, okay, why? And they're, and most times they'll say, well, cause it gives you credibility. Like you've been in the classroom, you understand some of the struggles we're going through. And I said that, and that's why I intentionally shared that. So sometimes when adults are giving kids advice, they're giving them advice on how to use this stuff, never using it themselves. And so I'm like, so to the kids, when you're giving them advice, but they don't have, when you're out of balance and Wilverson wrote a post about this years ago, they see you as out of balance because you don't use the technology and you don't have the credibility with that too. Mm -hmm. And like, even I, I'm sure, I don't know how much you, you, you two follow me, but you know, I've lost a ton of right. weight over the last few years. Mm -hmm. yep. And part of that is not looking at my phone first thing in the morning. Cause I would get sucked into the Twitter, TikTok black hole, but, and I would skip my workouts. Whereas I like, don't even touch my phone except for to play music in the morning, uh, for my workout. And, and I feel so much better, um, doing that. But I also use technology, right? Like, and I use it at the times I turn off all my notifications. So I think, you know, that's a really important conversation. And when we are having that conversation with students, do we have the credibility from our usage of it and saying, here are some of the pitfalls that I've experienced and here are some of the good things I've experienced. So, um, there is one question I want to ask, you know, I'll turn this over to you, Ryan. Um, I'm, I'm really cur curious about this cause I'm sure there's overlap, right? But how does like, when you say to this successful middle school instructional technology, how is this like, what is the overlap between, Hey, any school could use this, but this is also how it's specifically geared towards middle school. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm glad you asked that question because we, we feel like there definitely is some overlap. You know, we originally approach a topic from that middle school lens because what we wanted to marry the successful characteristics of a, of a middle school to technology practices. Uh, but within that conversation, uh, we, we think this work is applicable to elementary, to high school, and, and, and to any school. And, you know, some of the activities that we wrote within the book are applicable to, to, any, to any level. And, and we, we would say, just apply your high school filter, your elementary filter of what we know best of, of, of what works with that age level to your instructional plan. Um, you know, within, within the book, we talk about in, instructional technology and how we talk about instructional technology is the most important discussion of our time in education right now. And we, we firmly believe that uh, because technology touches all aspects of our life. Uh, inside and outside of the classroom, as soon as students are walking out the door, their phones in hand. So how we talk about technology as educators and as 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 a school and as a system is is so critically important. And I think that's that that is is where we really kind of missed the mark. Uh, you know, you, you hit on on the, on the last part of the conversation, and that oftentimes we don't reflect upon our own usage and, and we have an activity in there that, hey, if we're going to be good teachers of, of, of technology use for our students, boy, we better take a step back and be reflective on how we are using it as well and what our practices look like. Uh, it, you know, I, I, I said to a group one time, like, hey, you know, if, if you're saying put your phone in the cell phone jail and, you know, you're, you're saying technology bad, 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 you lost those kids. Like, like they're gone. Like, like they, they think you're a dinosaur. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you, you know, so think using those really choice words and being very deliberate about our, our ways that, that we connect with kids around technology. Yeah. He, yeah. And I'll, I'm going to give everyone an assignment right now. So you, a bunch of people are listening to this podcast. They're listening to this and I'm sure you're gaining some ideas, some thinking you might agree, disagree with some of the stuff that's been said. If you really want to go to the next level, blog about it. Do a podcast, do a TikTok response, do an Instagram response, right? Comment, you know, on YouTube, share some thinking because that really changes it. Cause I think a lot of it, when we look at technology, it's about the inputs that go into our brains, but it's not necessarily with the output. And that's where I, that's where I truly believe that the best learning happens is when you actually take the information, even like, even I've been saying this for years, when you go to a conference, like go see a keynote. And then skip the next session to blog about the keynote. And then that will be so much more powerful than some of the sessions you can go to. Not because the sessions aren't great after. And you can do the opposite. You can skip the keynote, do it from a breakout, whatever. But it's really, that's where the learning becomes your own. So I think that's a really important conversation. I know, Tim, you had something to say on this. Topic. Yeah, George. So um, you think about your, your days as an as a educational leader. When, when building a budget, the, the, the best organizations, they will fund their vision as opposed to visioning their fund, right? right? And it's the same approach with what we're talking about in the book is what is your vision and then fund your vision with action to, to, to reach, to have the students and your staff reach that vision as opposed to here's the stuff, right. now go do with it, right? And then, then you, what, then you have some happy accidents we'll call them that that make you feel good about oh look at what we're doing over here we'll mm -hmm. highlight this stuff but then we're going to forget all the skeletons in the closet where it's not working out right with this teacher isn't really using it or whatever and so again it's about what is what is your purpose for having technology and then let's support a system that gets you to that purpose as opposed to eh, you know it's just you know here's some money here's some stuff go go do and then you know we hope that it'll work out you know, so um, Allison Apsey and I are working on a book right now. And one of the things that we talk about is kind of what you said is like really that resource maximizer, right? And it's not like a really exciting thing when you're talking about like budgets and stuff like that, but it's so crucial. And I, I really get bothered with the, the like, we don't need managers, we need leaders. I actually need people to be both, right? So leadership is that vision. Management actually is how you how you actually fund it and how you feed it and like how you allocate time to it and stuff like that too. So um, I, Covey says it really, really well. And I, I can't remember if he wrote this or I just heard him saying it. But he said, um, leadership is about people and management is about things. And you need to be able to be good at both if you're really trying to bring this you know, vision that you're talking about to fruition. So last question I got for both of you, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Ryan. I'll start with you first. 
Um, one minute or less, what do you hope this book achieves when it comes out? So we want to help schools kind of take the next step. Uh, you know, we want to make sure they're, they're using technology uh, to, its, to its best potential, uh, that you're engaging kids, that when, when, when students leave that school, th they have an amazing experience to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a middle school principal, we talked about being that school. Like, that's the terminology we use. We said, what do we need to do to be that school? And meaning, like, when you look back on your time in, in, in school, like, we, we, we talked at a, a different podcast about teachers and admin that made a difference on our lives. Like, what is the school that, that made a difference on your life? Mm -hmm. So how, my hope is that, that our book can help schools be that school that make a difference in kids' lives. Tim, how about you? Yeah, I'm hoping that this book will inspire uh, teachers and leaders to look at things differently and try differently. I, I want uh, people to feel like, okay, I have some tools now, some suggestions to try to lead with the use of technology differently and better. We might have hit a ceiling or we feel like we're kind of stagnant. Here's some some ideas, some, you know, in essence, a roadmap to try to try to be better leaders when it comes to instructional technology so we can actually achieve the outcomes we want. And I'm not talking about just test scores, I'm talking mm -hmm. about the engagement, the, the relevance of school to the students and how to empower staff to, to, to take that on and to lead and feel like they can take risks as an organization because at the end of the day, schools have to evolve to where the kids are at. It's not about putting the kids in our boxes. It's about reaching out to them. And now with the one-to-one -one, mm. uh, initiatives that are out there and the, the device access, it's the, the instruction may seem harder, but it's actually the, to reach the individual children and students. It's easier because now you can kind of push things out and allow them to, to be where they're at and move, them, move themselves and help them move along. But I, I really hope this book gets adults to question where they're at mm -hmm. and to to evolve to greater heights than they thought they could be at or that they want to be at. Well, I'm excited for it. And everyone who's listening, check out the new book from Tim and Ryan, uh, Successful Middle School Instructional Technology. It is available now. You can see it in the description down below. So congratulations to you both, guys. That's uh, pretty exciting for you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank yeah, you my for pleasure. your time, George. Appreciate it. Appreciate all you do. I hope it does well. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.